Saudi Arabia bankrolled reactionary movements throughout the world. I mean, yeah. uh, the Saudi government had close ties with the South African apartheid regime. And even when there was a boycott against South Africa regime, uh, the Saudis made available their own oil on the spot market for South Africa at, uh, under apartheid. They also bankrolled the anti-communist movement, including the Contras in uh, Latin America, they, in Central America. Also, uh, do not forget that they also contributed money to the Christian Democrat in Italy, all in order to prevent the communist rise in that country. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. The Arab Gulf countries are composed of a handful of families appointed by the British Empire and sustained by the American Empire. Thanks to the immense wealth upon which they float and the tiny populations they rule, they're able to finance campaigns against each other and wars throughout the Middle East. Rather than using their wealth to develop sustainable economies, they've exported their wealth to the West to compensate it for the protection it affords them. They've created consumerist societies with citizens who are uneducated and greedy while they buy enough weapons to conquer the world. Yet somehow they can't fight their own wars and need U.S. bases and military protection. When they're not busy bickering with each other or engaged in media wars, they've financed the destruction of the Arab left and the rise of Sunni extremism. The Saudis financed Saddam's eight-year war on Iran and have been engaging in their own genocidal war against Yemen. The Emiratis financed coups in Egypt and Sudan, warlords in Libya and extremists in Yemen to fight the slightly less extreme Muslim brothers. The Qataris helped finance the destruction of Syria using extremists like Ahrar al-Sham and Jabhat al-Nusra. And these dictatorships, alongside the extremist apartheid state of Israel, are America's strategic partners. To discuss the history of the Gulf states as Western imperial outposts and the damage they've done and continue to do in that capacity, I'm joined by Asad Abu Khalil, a Lebanese-American professor of political science at California State University, a prolific writer, and the original angry Arab. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Asad, welcome back to the show. Welcome to you. I am privileged to be on this show. Well, thank you so much for saying that. I'm excited for this topic. I mean, let's just jump right into it. Um, I guess a good place to start when we talk about the Gulf states is, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting and a bit infuriating to me how the areas of the Middle East that have been historically these like great and very ancient civilizations from like Iraq to Syria to Palestine have been completely destroyed by West, not completely, but have been destroyed by Western imperialism in so many ways. And of course, with the help of these uber wealthy, small Gulf states that have, you know, very short histories and owe those histories to their great wealth as, um, as well as their willingness to collaborate with imperialism. And of course, here I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and you know, the British knew, the British basically like invented, I mean, let's start with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is essentially like a British creation. Can you maybe walk us through like a brief background on the British role in helping to create what is today like the modern day country of Saudi Arabia? And we can go from there. Right. Uh, well, I mean, the thing is, the entire Middle East has really been shaped by colonial powers. I mean, people forget it's not only the French, the British, but also the Italians, uh, you know, Africa, the role of Belgium and Germany. I mean, this has been an open arena for colonial powers to shape, to mold, to create uh, entities from nowhere and also to kill a large number of people. And I think the case in Saudi Arabia is that they were the Hashemites located in Western Arabia and they had a prestigious lineage, according to Muslims by virtue of their descent from the prophet. And they were favored by the British and they favored the British. And then uh, in Central Arabia, there arose this uh, family of the House of Saud, which aligned themselves with the descendant 
of a very fanatical preacher, uh, somebody without any formal uh, religious or regular education, and that is the founder <coughs> of Wahhabi sect. And this alliance struck at the heart of the Muslim world because it projected a version of Islam that has not been had not been familiar before or since, which is a very fanatical version that declared the infidelity of anybody who is not within the same narrow spectrum. They fought fellow Sunnis, they fought the Hashemites, they fought the Shiites, they were trying to enlarge and expand and so on. Uh, but then they confined their aspiration into what became Saudi Arabia. And of course, if clients of the British are fighting among each other, uh, or the Americans, uh, colonial powers are very flexible. They basically will throw their lots on whoever prevails uh, without any tears shed uh, over those who lose. Uh, I mean, that's the history of Saudi Arabia. It is a very fanatical state that posed an extreme version of Islam. And by virtue of oil money, they were spreading that version throughout the Muslim world. This is at a time, Rania, where progressive Islam was the norm. You have to remember, especially early 20th century, this is the area of progressiveness, of feminism, of ideas of secularism and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, at that time, there was the contrast that was represented by Saudi Arabia. And they used the oil money to support the reactionary regime and to fight against the progressive regimes that presented this very new revolutionary model of Islam and of Arabness. That one that was uh, opposed... Uh, that represented by Jamal Abdul Nasser of Egypt, who ruled from 1954 until 1970 uh, when he died under mysterious circumstances, in my opinion. And I really suspect the hand of the American in that, even though I have no proof. But I always am interested in that subject. Now, uh, at that time, the Saudi royal family declared that Jamal Abdul Nasser was an infidel. And of course, they were the forefront of the fight against communism and socialism and progressiveness, and that in, co in cahoots with all Western powers. I mean, that's the irony, is that Western powers today claim to be representing through their NGO clients a progressive, uh, <laughs> right. you know, a progressive uh, feminist model and so on. While in reality, the West was in bed with the most reactionary, anti-feminist, misogynistic regime of, of the Arab world. Uh, so, I mean, this is in a, a, a nutshell. Of course, after the Second World War, uh, the British were pushed aside by the Americans, and the Americans became the new colonial powers that tried to win favor with the Arabs by claiming uh, that they do not have any colonial heritage. Of course, in reality, ever since the Second World War, the Americans have killed and launched enough wars in various names, sometimes in the name of fighting communism, sometimes in the name of fighting terrorism, whatever name they had, and uh, in the midst of that, they basically established a record of bloodshed that is really similar to the record of bloodshed of colonial powers like France and Britain. You know, I think there's two things that you hit on that are so important there. And one is the issue of the, the very extremist version of Islam, Wahhabism that Saudi Arabia represents being projected on the rest of the region and having you know devastating impact until today that's one and then two the issue of you know the way that the americans took over after the british i mean the british literally financed the saudi royal family um in this very bloody i mean they financed this entire like ikhwan army that went on this crazy killing spree across the region like you mentioned in the early 20th century and then afterwards this this army of like killers actually became the saudi uh, religious morality police, which is funny that that's never discussed, even though everybody's obsessing over Iran's morality police right now. But that's a story for another day. But the second thing you mentioned, which is so important, is the Cold War and the importance of Saudi Arabia during the Cold War. And the way that Saudi Arabia and in the Muslim Brotherhood as well uh, was used by the Americans uh, as you know, in part of this ongoing strategy to use religious conservatism as a tool to control the region and particularly against anyone it considered an enemy. You mentioned Nasser. I mean, this was used against communism, socialism, Arab nationalism. Um, and this has been Saudi Arabia's role 
uh, especially as like a financial, as a way to finance all of these things. Saudi Arabia was often used as a conduit for money. But one thing that you talked about the last time I had you on, because I think a lot of us, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people are somewhat familiar with the way that it like radical this kind of radical Islamic extremism was used during the Cold War against the left. But you saw, spoke specifically about Lebanon and the way that the Gulf states, I think it was particular, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Saudi Arabia and Kuwait in particular played a role in the Lebanese civil war, which you have characterized as initially at least a war against the Arab left. Um, and then also has inter continued to interfere in Lebanese politics since then and then since then in various ways. So can you Tell us about the role that Saudi Arabia and perhaps other Gulf states played during the civil war in Lebanon and then afterwards. Right, right. Uh, we should add to that uh, record, uh, Rania, that Saudi Arabia bankrolled reactionary movements throughout the world. I mean, yeah. uh, the Saudi government had close ties with the South African apartheid regime. And even when there was a boycott against South Africa regime, uh, the Saudis made available their own oil on the spot market for South Africa at, up, under apartheid. They also bankrolled the anti-communist movement, including the Contras in uh, Latin America, they in Central America. Also, uh, do not forget that they also contributed money to the Christian Democrat in Italy, all in order to prevent the communist rise in that country. I mean, now there's a new record this week about the British sinister role to prevent communism from coming into power. I mean, we speak about uh, ads on Facebook by Russia that intended to subvert democracy in the United States. The United States and the West has been in the business of subverting every single democracy, including their own in the West, if there was a rise of socialist or communist. And the socialists in France were only accepted when they basically subscribed to Zionism as well as to imperialism. Now, as far as, I mean, even the communists in Europe, of course, uh, really compromise a lot in their ideology in order to be accepted in polite company in Western colonial powers. Uh, as far as Lebanon is concerned, Rania, there's a very long history of Gulf regimes bankrolling the reactionary groups inside Lebanon. Even before the outbreak of the civil war in 1975, the Saudis and the Shah of Iran and Western powers supported the regime of Kamil Shamoun against the progressive and the Arab nationalist in 1958. There was a mini civil war in 1958 and uh, the lines were drawn and the Gulf regimes in the West were squarely on the side of uh, Kamil Shamoun, a president who wanted to extend his term for another six years and the people of Lebanon revolted and they were supported by the Arab nationalists uh, of, of, of the Arab world and by Nasser. And of course it ended when the American Marines uh, basically invaded Lebanon in 1958 and they also deployed troops inside Jordan because they were so alarmed by the coup of 1958 which brought an end to the Hashemite uh, government of Iraq. Uh, it is in that context where Gulf regimes threw their lot with the reactionary, we're talking about right-wing, Christian, anti-Muslim, anti-progressive forces that were uh, creating a whole uh, drama about the specter of communism prevailing in the Arab world and looming over Lebanon. By 1958, Rania, the Gulf regimes have been funding the arming of the Falange Party, this anti-Palestinian pro-Israeli party. And this is the irony that some people may not be aware of, which is the Falange and the right-wing uh, death squads of Lebanon were receiving aid, money, and arms from the Shah of Iran, from the Gulf regimes, from Israel, and from the West at the same time. That's how the war broke out in 1975. And on the other side, there was a Palestinian resistance and the Lebanese left. And I am reviewing uh, in a series of articles for Al-Akhbar in the last several weeks, a new memoirs in three volumes by former prime minister of Lebanon, Saib Salam, who lived for much of the 20th century. And he was a pro-Saudi client of uh, uh, the House of Sauds, specifically of uh, you know, uh, King Fahad and Prince Sultan. And he also talks about that, that they were supporting the phalange against the left because they were afraid, according to him, that the Muslims were being swept, swept by the communist tide. So, uh, yeah, they had a very strong role. And the thing is, just like the West, the Saudis in Lebanon uh, never once not intervened heavily on the side of the most reactionary forces 
and on those that were adopting the Israeli agenda in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, it was the Falange. At one point, it was the Ahrar party. In recent years, it's the March 14. Lately, mm -hmm. it is these, uh, these cute revolutionaries we have. You know what I mean? We have revolutionaries in Lebanon. I don't know if you encountered them. These revolutionaries are of special kind. I mean, they love Saudi Arabia and they love the UAE regime, but they call themselves revolutionaries. Why do they call themselves revolutionaries? Because they oppose any resistance to Israel. And they believe by adopting the NATO agenda, and they have their own websites, and they have their own news sources, and they call their media independent media because, you know, the State Department refers to media that it funds in developing countries as independent media. Mm -hmm. So those revolutionaries are also supported by the Saudi and the UAE regime. It's amazing. It is incredible. It really is. Um, but how, I mean, there's also the Iran-Iraq war. I want to, I'm curious if you could talk a bit about that too, because this is something I didn't know until more recently. I didn't know the role that the Saudis played in financing uh, the Iraq war on Iran. It, it literally, in some case, in some ways could not have happened without Gulf state financing. No doubt. And this was Saudi Arabia's like way, I mean, from from once after the revolution happened in 1979 in Iran to try to confront Iran because that revolution posed a threat to Saudi Arabia in many ways, both because they were worried, I think, about internal destabilization in their own country and also concerned about Iran's ability to project its influence across the region. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we forget about the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted from 1980 until 1988. And it's lasted that long and resulted in a death of between a half a million to a million people because the United States wanted to go on. I mean, as Henry Kissinger famously said, the best policy we have to that war is by uh, trying to defeat both sides at the same time. And for that reason, the United States plays a role behind the scene to make sure that's possible. But the phenomenon of Saddam Hussein, this tyrant and the personality cult, was, would not have been possible without bankrolling from the Gulf regimes. I mean, they really threw their money in the tens of billions of dollars into the regime of Saddam Hussein. Because as you know, he invaded Iran. He thought he was going to put an end to the Islamic revolution because the Gulf regimes would like to bring back the Shah of Iran because the Shah of Iran was close ally of Israel and NATO. And they wanted that model with which they could do business. And mm -hmm. they did plenty of business. They were on the same side with the Shah of Iran for all these years. And what is very ironic is that today, with all the noise about Iran, Iranian role, and the sinister role of Iran, these same regimes were very much in tune with the Shah of Iran at the time. And they never spoke about the evil of Iranian history or about the Safavid dynasty, because now there is a very racist and sectarian undertones and overtones to the rhetoric of Gulf regimes about Iran and against Iran. So uh, they thought they're going to bring an end to that, because at that time, the Iran revolution was destabilizing as a model to the Gulf regime, and, they, and also it stirred excitement among Shiites in the Gulf, and they were very alarmed by that. And uh, the new Iranian regime spoke about Palestine in a way that they would not speak. So right. it was too threatening to their own legitimacy. And for that reason, they thought to put an end to it. And that's what they did. And later, I mean, that's irony, later, when the United States decided to bring down Saddam's regime, they also threw their money <laughs> in order to support American effort. And we still don't know the exact role that Saudi Arabia played in the 2003 war in Iraq. But Saud al-Faisal, before his death, spoke in a, uh, in a very subtle manner about how much Saudi Arabia assisted the American war effort. I know as, a, as an observer how all Saudi uh, Arabian media were marshaled in the cause of attack on Iraq and supporting the war effort of the United States. I know it is. And, and, and that doesn't even speak to the way that Saudi Arabia played a role in helping to foment some of the sectarian hate that spread across the region and kind of started in Iraq. But we can get to that in a bit. I also wanted to ask, I mean, Saudi Arabia has got its hand in everything. And I'm glad you actually zoomed out globally in terms of their role in supporting reactionary governments here or there. And of course, always on the side of the American agenda. Right. But what's little known is also their role in the it, when it comes to the issue of Palestine. And this is something I didn't know until more recently, too. Can you talk about 
the Saudi role in helping to maybe pacify is the night, not the right word, but I'm not sure what is, but That's using right its word. funding ability to help pacify organizations like the PLO and basically controlling various Palestinian groups to essentially become sellouts. You're absolutely right, Rania. I mean, pacify is the right word. Uh, abort the Palestinian revolution is another term for sure. I don't know why I look too serious. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at myself. I look too stern. And it's serious. a serious topic. It's a serious topic, though. Yeah, it is a serious topic. The thing is, like, my default posture is very serious and down. <laughs> you got the arms crossed. It's a very professorial. It's because yeah, you're and, a professor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I'm always advised to smile more and be more relaxed and so on. So I'm trying. Uh, no, you're right. I think that the phenomenon of Yasser Arafat, I mean, Yasser Arafat was by far the worst leader of the Palestinian national movement over two, over two centuries. Uh, okay. Since the beginning of the Zionist onslaught of the late 19th uh, century, I mean, from the 1880s onward, there were various Palestinian national leaders. And we speak about Hajj Amin, how he met with Hitler twice, and how reprehensible that is. We speak about the bombast of Ahmed al the first leader of the PLO from 1964 to 1968. We speak about these leaders and we forget that someone is much worse than those two. And that is by far Yasser Arafat. And Yasser Arafat is, without a doubt, a phenomenon that was created by the Gulf regime. Because when the rise of the Fatah movement in the 1960s, I mean, there were various leaders of the movement. And many of, some of, several of them were more radical than Yasser Arafat. I mean, not too radical, but more radical than Yasser Arafat. And they really wanted to destabilize the region, to overthrow regimes, and to be serious about the model of armed struggle. Suddenly, yes, Arafat was able to prevail. I mean, we don't know how that happened. But there is no doubt there's a new book by a courageous Palestinian journalist, Mohammed Dalba, which is banned in uh, the Palestinian territories under the rule of the collaborationist regime of Mahmoud Abbas. And he exposes the extent to which Gulf regimes through their own personalities, were able to dominate the agenda of Yasser Arafat and the PLO in order to steer it away from the revolutionary model of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and others who were keen on really presenting a model of armed struggle. And uh, so that is part of the legacy of the Gulf regimes. Look at the UAE today, Rania. I mean, the UAE today is not happy with the collaborationist regime of Mahmoud Abbas a man who is despised by his own people. And the only reason he's there because Europeans and Westerners want him there. And uh, the, the model that the UAE is presenting is one that is even worse than Mahmoud Abbas, believe it or not. They have their own thug, Mohammed Dahlan, who they want to replace Mahmoud Abbas as the head of the corrupt collaborationist regime of the uh, Oslo entity. Yeah, yeah. It's no, it's it's horrible. And uh, Saudi, I mean, the Gulf states have always been like they used to pay lip service to the issue of Palestine. And of course, that's completely changed today, where now they're just like actively normalizing relations with Israel. And we're going to get to that as well. But honestly, I mean, all this time, like when you're describing the role that Saudi Arabia specifically has played, it is on the same line as Israel. Like all of those, whether it's South African apartheid, whether it's the Contras, like they were, but they're both always on the same side. They just haven't ever been officially allies, but they're, I mean, they essentially have been all this time. So what you just described makes perfect sense because any revolutionary movement in the Middle East that takes any form is a threat to these Gulf monarchies. Oh, no. I want to, I want to get to though, the issue of also Afghanistan. Um, and I think this is interesting because, you know, Saudi Arabia did play a very important role in the U.S. covert war in Afghanistan. Um, UAE in, more than Saudi Arabia. What? UAE more than Saudi Arabia. Real, okay, that I didn't know about. So I want to hear more about yeah. that, too. The UAE yeah. actually sent their own troops. And there was one of the members of the royal family who used to go there, was in charge of the troops. They sent actually troops. The Saudis are more cautious. So it was as you Well, said, are we talking about 1980s or are we talking about the 2000s? Oh, I'm talking about the, Yeah, yeah. No, 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 I was going to say wait, in the 1980s. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, cuz I mean but this is that's what's so interesting about Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. Of course it goes back so much further in the 1980s <laughs> specifically. I you, there is no imperialist <laughs> war effort in which those regimes did not collaborate from the right. Second World War onward. I yeah. mean, whether it's on Oman, whether it's in the Western Sahara, whether it's in Somalia, they were always on the side of imperialism. 
uh, they have a very consistent record, really. They do. They do. And in the 1980s in Afghanistan specifically, I mean, Saudi Arabia was essentially the bank, right? Saudi Arabia like subsidized that more entire than, uh, war effort. They matched the American funding. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, more than money, Rania, because as you know, right. they were the instrumental in the formation of an international band of fanatic Muslims from around the world who are willing to go and fight communism because they are atheists. I mean, right. that's how bin Laden was born. There are many bin Ladens. We only hear about bin Laden. The Saudis basically would give you a free plane ticket and expenses if you would volunteer from any part of the Muslim world to go and fight the communists in Afghanistan in the 1980s. So Saudi Arabia was extremely instrumental. But you see, the Saudis blame the Americans. The Americans blame mm -hmm. the Saudis. In reality, right. they were equal partner in crime. 100%. They were both responsible and, of course, the Pakistani intelligence for the phenomenon of uh, bin Laden. We should also add all Gulf regimes were contributing to the war effort because from the 1950s, during the Cold War, all Gulf regimes, the oil, I mean, it is fair to say that the money for the fanatical Cold War against progressiveness and communism was bankrolled by oil money, Arab oil money. The Americans were shifting the proceeds and forcing these governments to fund their own project against communism in the region and beyond. That's, I mean, and all, and of course, what do these families get in return is they get to be these hereditary monarchies that get to stay in power right. forever, right? Yeah. And mean, Donald Trump was very honest about that. He said, it's yeah. very clear, those dynasties would not have survived if it wasn't for American support. And for that reason, he said, we can afford to issue them orders because we have saved their neck and we keep them in power. I mean, he said it very clearly and explicitly. Yeah, there's one thing you got to appreciate about Donald Trump is his willingness right. to just say things so openly and honestly. But I mean, the importance of what happened in Afghanistan in the 1980s and what you just mentioned, of course, Saudi Arabia also find, uh, provided the ideological framework for Absolutely. the Wahhabi framework. Well, well, in this case, it was a, a version of Wahhabism, right? All these Saudis went to the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, helped set up these religious schools that would later give rise to the Taliban. That's literally where the Taliban comes out of. Exactly. That's also where some of Wahhabism, yeah. Exactly. And that's, of course, also, you know, more importantly to, I guess, an American audience, this is where Osama bin Laden really gets his, like, push. You know, he's essentially a CIA asset. And later, after the Mujahideen, like, you know, fails to be in charge of Afghanistan, the Taliban takes over, he helps form out or he leads the group Al Qaeda, which goes on to carry out uh, 9 11, 15 of the 19 hijacker, hijackers were Saudi. I think there's probably much about 9 11 and who may or may not have known that we still don't know about. But what we do know is that this person who was once a, uh, an ally of the Americans is now leading this group that's on a global jihad against the West. And you were, I mean, you were a public figure around this time. You, you know, would get invited on mainstream media sometimes. There's this famous clip of you that I actually would have loved to play on Bill Maher, or deal, you know, arguing with Bill Maher, but for concerns about copyright infringement, I won't. But right. my question for you here is, on a personal level, like things switched around after 9-11. Muslims became the bad guys. Not that they weren't before, but in this case, they really became the bad guys. Islam was constantly invoked to justify destabilizing the Middle East, intervening everywhere, bombing any country that America wanted to on this like global killing spree they called the war on terror. So from your perspective, what was it like knowing this history of U.S. support for radical Islamic extremism, which now is the big enemy, and then seeing the Islamophobia that came out of 9-11 that the U.S. was totally complicit in? You're absolutely right. And the thing is, like, uh, as you know, I come from a left-wing revolutionary background, uh, Lebanese and Palestinian uh, groups and uh, circles in Lebanon. And uh, we were very much always against the U.S. side. I mean, I always say to Americans, uh, during the war in Afghanistan, America was on the side of bin Laden. People like me, the leftists, we were on the side of the progressive feminist regime of the communists in Afghanistan. I mean, when people post these pictures <laughs> of how lovely Afghanistan used to be, that's when it was progressive. That's when it was communist. I mean, the communists were really a popular movement inside Afghanistan. But the Americans and Saudis were threatened by that movement. And they were the ones 
who brought these fanatics, they are really fanatics, into the White House, lionized them. Ronald Reagan compared him to the founding fathers. So how it felt to me personally, it felt like, uh, I mean, I'm all too familiar with Western hypocrisy and lies and deception. I grew up around it all my life. I see the rhetoric on Palestine. Uh, and, but but uh, I mean, you, you, you said it yourself, like, but the Islamophobia and the ideology of hostility against Arabs and Muslims has always been there. I arrived to this country in 1983. I was 23 years old, an innocent looking 23 years old. And yet, and yet, I mean, sure, I had a mustache at the time. <laughs> but I mean, I was so harassed at airports throughout the years. And imagine I used to travel on a Lebanese passport. That was lovely during the 1980s and the movies, the Delta Force and all these. Uh, when when Israeli intelligence companies were producing movies, I mean, to me that is that is so incredible. There were Israeli Mossad people who set up shop in Hollywood, and they were bankrolling anti-Arab, anti-Muslim movies like Delta Force and shaping public opinion against Arabs and Muslims. I mean, imagine this is like having an anti-Semite setting up shop in Hollywood and producing movies against Jews. I mean, yes. it is so crazy, but that's Anahem Golan and these people who set up shop produce these movies. So I was not amused of how America's rhetoric and actions were regarding Arabs and Muslims long before September 11. But after September 11, it became very, very blatant. I mean, I remember speaking to Edward Said a few days or weeks after September 11, and he was really concerned about his safety because the, the climate of New York was, was just insane, uh, if people remember. I mean, there were scores. I mean, their, their story has never been told, by the way. There were innocent Muslims who were rounded up throughout the United States. And some of them stayed there for months and years for no crimes. I mean, there's this uh, ostensible comedian in Lebanon and he was, uh, who is now active and so on. And he's also a revolutionary, by the way, you would like to know. And he also was rounded up because he was an art student and he had the box cutter, and they put him there for many months. Uh, so, uh, uh, so personally, when I look at it, I think that the uh, United States has been cons consistently deceptive, consistently violent, consistently Zionist, consistently Islamophobic, and consistently and squarely against the forces of progressiveness and socialism in the Arab world and beyond. So. Uh, I mean, I never had faith in that power to be disappointed. Yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, I think people should have been disappointed a long time ago. And if they were, if they were disappointed after September 11, it means they were misled by American rhetoric long before that. I mean, this is why I hate some people from the Middle East when they tell me, "Oh, if only can America's foreign policy be as democratic as its domestic policy." And I tell them, <laughs> "You hear that too, right, Radia?" You hear that? Right? You hear that right? And you have to tell them America's domestic policy is as cruel, as vicious as its foreign policy. But you hear, I mean, I heard that once from a decent uh, prime minister of Lebanon, Salim al Hus, who said that to me. And I was like, what domestic policy are you aware of how undemocratic? Hollywood, Hollywood. They get yeah. their understanding of American domestic policy is what they see in Hollywood movies. Yeah, but I mean, Salim al-Hus studied at Indiana University where he got his PhDs in the 90s. Oh, he should know better. He should yeah. know. Wow. I know. Wow. <laughs> I just, I remember, I remember being, so I was in high school when 9-11 happened and I just remember being so incredibly frustrated with the depiction. I mean, obviously like I had experienced anti-Arab, anti-Muslim stuff, but not to the extent of 9-11. And I just remember being so blown away by the fact that Saudi Arabia and it's like all of this anti-Muslim stuff, all of the idea of what Islam even is, was coming out of the stereotype of Saudi Arabia. Like it's like the Saudi Arabia, the, the, the Islam that they project Correct. is the one that everybody imposes on the rest of us and then hates. Correct. Um, and that, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, that's the irony though, right? Yeah. America, America sponsors and protects the Saudi version of Islam. And then American culture laments Islam because it's like Saudi Islam. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. that's what is, I mean, I always tell them that's America's Islam. That's yeah. not the Arabs' Islam. Uh, on a personal anecdote, I want to say to you the following about September 11. I mean, I have many anecdotes I can share, but uh, one of them, I mean, I remember speaking to Edward Said and he was talking about how the climate is horrific in New York City and so on. 
and I felt an obligation to to appear on the media and so on. That's when I used to agree to appear on on uh, American mainstream media. Uh, I mean, not that I'm being asked anymore, but I used to be asked a lot, and I and I used to respond. So I appear on Fox News, CNN. Uh, I mean, I have horrible stories to tell. MSNBC is a liberal one. I was on it one time to analyze one of the speeches of Bin Laden, and I said here in a segment that they showed, he is talking about the civilian casualties in Afghanistan, because as you know, there are civilians who are being killed by U.S. bombing. I mean, America's bombing was so reckless in Afghanistan that during the Bush administration, they decided that we need to win the hearts of Afghan people because we're dropping a lot of bombs on them. And 25% of them were missing their targets. So they said, let us throw food on the people of Afghanistan. That should improve our PR. So they started dumping packages of rice and beans on the people of Afghanistan. And they also killed them with their soft power. I mean, that's soft power, right? Mm -hmm. But they, instead of throwing small packages, they were throwing huge crates of rice and beans. Scores of Afghani people were killed by America's... You're... Wow. Right. Jesus Christ. So I mentioned on MSNBC that, uh, you know, that people are being killed. And the, the guy, who I think now moved to another network, uh, he said to me, uh, you sound like Bin Laden. Yeah, just like that. Of and can you imagine? Can you imagine in the climate? I went home that day. It was in San Francisco. I can't I even went, imagine the amount of death threats you probably got from that. I was getting death threats almost on a daily basis. I mean, they have, uh, my school was really protective. I go one day to my uh, office at school, and somebody had put an American flag with industrial glue on my door to send a message to me. Uh, I was so annoyed and irritated that I took my key and I carved out that flag. <laughs> I mean, the door has been damaged permanently since, but uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, uh, and I would get like so many uh, death threats like that. Uh, I mean, so many stories to tell. And one time I appear on Fox News and this uh, woman uh, who was interviewing me, she said uh, to me, she took a passage I wrote in, in my book about uh, Bin Laden and so on. And she said, she wrote this passage, which is something innocuous, really. And she said, uh, Professor Abu Khalil, do you believe America is the great Satan? <laughs> I said, what? I said, I don't believe in Santa Claus. And said, I don't know what that means. What do you mean, great Satan? Uh, I mean, it was so insane that then I stopped, you know. Uh, last mainstream interview I did was with Anderson Cooper. And in the middle of the interview, I had a, an epiphany. I thought to myself, Am I going to continue into my years of retirement to speak about the likes of Anderson Cooper about foreign policy and Hezbollah? And, uh, you know, so I stopped ever since. And now I appear on the loony left, like people like, <laughs> like me, they, which they, I appreciate, which I appreciate. You know, but Rania, even the left has been poisoned. Look yeah. at the Arab left. I mean, oh, you God. live in Lebanon. Yeah. I mean, the left there has become indistinguishable from the NGOs and from the NATO agenda. I mean, I think this is actually something that you can uh, say is maybe a problem in a lot of parts of the world, though, right? Is that Absolutely. the NGOization, the NGOization of oh, various forms of left, le European left is like the worst. They basically become like pro-NATO at this point. Oh, like whatever happened to the four left-wing members of the House? We don't hear of them during this war. Oh, uh, the squad, the squad. Right. Yeah, yeah, I don't even, do we still have a squad? Yes, you know, I, apparently, but I, they go quiet. <laughs> I do want to I do want to though move to what, what's so interesting about what happens next. It's really like a soap opera drama, uh, a very deadly one, the the American uh, policy and how it transforms. So 9-11 happens now where our big enemy is radical Islamic extremism. We invade Iraq and bring them Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda like opens the floodgates to Al Qaeda in Iraq. You mentioned we're not we're still not sure the extent of the Gulf states. Uh, participation. We know they participated. We don't know exactly, exactly. what they did. Exactly. But exactly. then something very interesting happens. You have the Israeli Hezbollah war in 2006, which Rania. Hezbollah came Rania. out. Yes. Rania. Yes. We we mean you mean the Israeli Lebanese war. Well, the Israeli Lebanese war, but I have to give you know, credit to Hezbollah. No, no, no. I know, for... I know. You, I know your intention, of course. But I just want to point out to you something you know. But I want to say to the audience, the Israelis and the Gulf propaganda 
would like to refer to it as Israel Hezbollah war. So they can separate Hezbollah from one, Lebanon. Yeah. To pretend that Hezbollah is some outside force from another planet. And two, to pretend that when Israel bombs Lebanon, it bombs Hezbollah, when in reality it bombs power stations, water yes. resources, hospitals, clinics, schools, universities, homes, and so on. So I just want to point that out. No, 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 that's a very, that's a very good point. I'm glad you corrected me on that. It yeah. was a Lebanese-Israeli war in which Hezbollah managed to once again push the Israelis humiliate. out of Lebanon, humiliate the Israelis, uh, and of course uh, create a, a kind of deterrence that has lasted until now. I mean, the reason that Israel has not continued to force its way into Lebanon or, you know, bomb Lebanon or really go to war with Lebanon is because they actually fear Hezbollah's retaliation, which they should. You're absolutely but right. this happens in 2006. Nasrallah becomes a very popular figure. You also have a Sunni Shia civil war taking place in Iraq at this time that hasn't quite spread to other parts of the region. And then what happens is the Bush administration, specifically Dick Cheney, in collaboration with uh, Prince Bandar, who was at the time, I think, the national security advisor in Saudi Arabia, um, and a few other sort of neoconservative figures like Elliot Abrams, uh, come up with this new strategy for the Middle East, what they call the redirection. And there's actually an article in The New Yorker by Seymour Hirsch called The Redirection that people can go look at because it's quite a prescient article in terms of reading it now in retrospect. But they're, they're, the whole idea of this redirection was our war in Iraq has empowered pro-Iranian Shias in Iraq and has therefore empowered Iran. Hezbollah's winning hearts and minds because they beat Israel. We're terrified of what they, they were terrified of what they called a Shia crescent, right? We constantly heard about this fear mongering about a Shia crescent. And so the Gulf states and the U.S. at this point collaborate to basically launch what essentially became an anti-Shia war across the Middle East. And that took the form of empowering Sunni extremists. Who are Sunni extremists? Well, there are people like Al Qaeda. And this is what's so fascinating is 9-11 happens. Al Qaeda is our big enemy. Then they become our friend again. And I want to read before I before I let you respond to all that, I do want to read this um, this paragraph from the Seymour Hirsch article that I mentioned, The Redirection, because it's so amazing. So this is back in 2007, this article. So this time, Bandar and other Saudis have assured the White House that they will keep a very close eye on the religious fundamentalists. Okay. Their message their message to us was, we've created this movement and we can control it. It's not that we don't want the Salafis to throw bombs, it's who they throw them at. Hezbollah, Muqtada al-Sadr, which is, by the way, ironic considering what Sadr is like today, but anyways, uh, Iran, and at the Syrians, if they continue to work with Hezbollah and Iran. Anyways, I think that that paragraph is so illuminating, but can you maybe from there, Asad, explain the backing of Sunni extremists, not as some sort of ancient hatred, because this was always described to us as, oh, there's an ancient hatred between Sunnis and Shias, which is maybe a little bit true. Like there's this ancient hatred, and that's why they're all fighting each other, when in fact, the US and its Gulf state allies post-2006 spent the next decade or more supporting Sunni extremists to try to weaken Iran and Hezbollah and the so-called Shia crescent, basically any resistance in the region to imperialism? Well, I mean, as you know, I was born to a Shiite father from South Lebanon, from Tyre, and a mother who is from Sunni from Beirut. I mean, it is true that, I mean, er, I mean, I was born in 1960, so there were animosities. It was more class that Sunnis from the cities looked down at Shiite from the South because they associate that with peasantry. I mean, there's class element. But it's not always the same class structure, Rania, mind you. Like, for example, in Kuwait and Bahrain, the wealthiest Shia, uh, wealthiest merchant families were Shiites. Mm. Uh, in Lebanon, the Shiites were the downtrodden largely and the poor, the garbage collectors, the shoe shiners. So there's a class condescension, all that. However, there is no question. I mean, Osama Makdisi, the historian at Rice University, spoke about that in his books. But... Uh, in the sense that to which colonial powers manipulated the sectarian religious differences for their own accord. I mean, this is not a conspiracy uh, uh, theory. Uh, this is actually true. There's a book called Army of Shadows, uh, published in Hebrew, about uh, uh, you know Israeli collaborators and Israeli effort to win Arab collaborators. And in that book, it spoke 1920. Hayim Wiseman, the new leader of the Zionist movement after Theodor Herzl, 
he goes and asks the people of the intelligence of the Zionist movement to draw up a plan against Arab opposition to Zionism. And one of the items of the plan was, I mean, I'm quoting verbatim, to sow discord between Christians and Muslims. Mm -hmm. You see, the first political formation of political organization among Palestinians was something called the Muslim Christian Association. Why did they form it? They formed it because they knew, they were aware that there was a Zionist plan to divide them as Christians and Muslims. And the Palestinians admirably avoided that discord for so many decades. Unfortunately, with the rise of religious movements and Hamas mm -hmm. and Islamic Jihad, then the secularism of the Palestinian movement in that count became weakened. Uh, but as far as the recent anti-Shiite war, there is no question about it. It was a joint American Gulf Israeli policy that was intended to undermine the basis of support for Hezbollah and Iran after the humiliating defeat of Israel. Mm -hmm. Israel has not stopped trying to do something about that strategic loss it suffered from the defeat of the July war in Lebanon. They have been tried so many ways, including launching a war against Shiites, mobilizing, agitating all Sunnis against Shiites. And I have to say this, unfortunately, by virtue of the massive campaign and the money that was devoted and all the media at their disposal and the billions of dollars spent, and by virtue of the incompetence of Hezbollah and Iran in countering that sectarian onslaught, especially with the intervention by Hezbollah in Syria, which assumed a sectarian cast of its own by virtue of the slogan that were invoked, the campaign has succeeded. I mean, the Israelis in the Gulf and the Westerners have succeeded in undermining the base of support. And for that reason, you find today support for Hezbollah as a resistance movement. I'm talking, not talking about their policies in Lebanon, which are, which are rather uh, atrocious, but as a resistance movement, has lacked any uh, support. Even in Palestine, uh, Rania, I mean, with the rise of Hamas, Mohammed Dahlan, before he was humiliatingly kicked out of Palestine by the Palestinian people, he used to hold rallies in which he would supervise, preside over a rally in which the crowd would chant against Hamas as Shiites, Shiites, Shiites. I mean, Mohammed Dahlan is a front man for the UAE regime. So, I mean, there is no mystery there about their role. And uh, this anti-Shiite campaign, and what is also very interesting about this anti-Shiite thing is that you find Western government praising this new communication and dialogue that the Saudi government and the UAE government is conducting with Jewish organization. All of them are Zionist organization, many of which were based in Israel. But they never point out that yes, they are falsely pretending that they are engaging in dialogue with Jewish groups, but their onslaught and campaign against Shiite continues in their media and their and their government curricula. I mean, that hasn't changed. Uh, but of course, they don't care as long as they are pro-Zionist and they are on good terms with Israel. And of course, these same governments, Rania, as we know, have been instrumental in the propagation of the most repugnant anti-Semitic literature among yeah. Muslims for so many decades since the Second World War. I mean, Saudi Arabia, there's a guy in Pakistan, his name is Ihsan al-Zahir. This guy has been bankrolled by the Saudis to have his own center against Shiites, but they established so many centers for the propagation of anti-Semitic literature throughout the Muslim world. It's After really disgusting. They pretended, oh, now we don't hate Jews, we just hate Shiites. And the West is very impressed with that rhetoric. They say, as long as you don't hate Jews, we don't mind you hating Shiites, we don't mind you hating Druze, we don't mind hating Christians, we don't mind hating anybody. As long as you hate Shias, as long yeah. as you hate Shias. And I mean, this, this of course, I think, Elena, not I think, I know laid a lot of the groundwork for what would become the rise of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, not the only reason. Other reasons contributed to that as well. For example, right. the war on Syria, which is why I, you know, we don't have to get into a debate about this now, but I just do want to, um, I do want to, say that I, I understand why Hezbollah got involved in Syria, that one, you you had these jihadist groups that, I mean, Syria and Lebanon border, 
very porous. And Hezbollah right. does consider itself a protector of Lebanon's ter territorial integrity. But furthermore, I think some of the slogans you might be talking about also had to do with the fact that, you know, there was this existential genocidal rhetoric towards Shias um, that would, you know, make it understandable that a Shia group might have to, like, get Shias, like, excited about fighting for their survival. But that's a story for a different day. I do want to play this real, very quick clip by who is somebody who is now the president of the United States, but uh, was then the vice president of the United States when he spoke these words about ISIS and Al Qaeda. And you'll see why I'm going to play this as soon as I do. Here it goes. What my constant cry was that our biggest problem is our allies. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. The Turks were great friends, and I have a great relationship with Erdogan, which I've just spent a lot of time with. The Saudis, the Emiratis, etc. What were they doing? They were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni Shia war. What did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens, thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad. Except that the people who were being, who were being supplied were Al Nusra and Al Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world. Now you think I'm exaggerating, take a look. Where did all of this go? So now what's happening? All of a sudden, everybody's awakened because this uh, outfit called ISIL, which was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which when they were essentially thrown out of Iraq, found open space and territory in in Western, excuse me, in Eastern Syria, work with Al Nusra, who we declared a terrorist group early on, and we could not convince our colleagues to stop supplying them. No, so, okay, before you say anything, that is so self serving. Obviously, it's the same thing you said about Afghanistan, where the Saudis and the Americans blame each other. America knew that the entire time. Uh, no, no. Go ahead. And yeah. First of all, I love this uh, clip. I haven't seen it. Uh, can you send it to me on yes, WhatsApp? Yes, I will. I will send it Please to you. It to me. It's yeah. an important one. I want to propagate it. And I really appreciate you for sharing it. One. And second, I thought to myself, for the first time, I agree with Joe Biden about anything, right? He <laughs> <laughs> sounds so reasonable, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and three... He sounds so much sharper than how he sounds oh, now. Yeah. Right? <laughs> a big, a big difference cognitively yeah, big for difference. sure. Yeah. Uh, and the fourth thing is what he, what he left unmentioned from his self-serving account, as you mentioned, is that uh, what he said about Al Nusra is not accurate. We know, I mean, from his own book, Ben Rhodes, who was a national security advisor, uh, deputy national security advisor to uh, uh, to Obama, he actually was calling for using Nusra as a friend of the United States. He was against declaring it as a terrorist organization. So it's not only the Saudis and the Emiratis. There was a segment of his own administration that wanted to have an alliance yes. with those terrorist groups in order to bring down the Assad regime. I just want to make a comment in passing about Hezbollah in Syria uh, without arguing about that intervention and so on and so forth. But the thing is, uh, succumbing to these religious slogans and chants and so on and so forth, basically wind up serving the enemy because they were played by the propaganda of the other side. I mean, you're right. Uh, these terrorist organizations were sending car bombs into Shiite neighborhoods. People don't forget that. Into mm -hmm. Shiite neighborhoods in Lebanon, in the southern suburbs. So there was a war going on. However, the way they managed their media and propaganda was absolutely serving to the enemies of of, of their own enemies. We'll have to we'll have to get you and Amr Mohsen on for a debate. Right. <laughs> I'm just hearing Amr and the other side of my ear. Right. <laughs> but no, I mean your point is well taken. But that you know, I just think it's so it's so funny how after all of this, now of course, like I now the, the, the war on Syria, like it's what you said is absolutely true by Ben Rhodes because you also had these remember these leaked emails of the Hillary Clinton's emails. I think it was Jake Sullivan who literally wrote an email saying Al Nusra is on our side. Right. Like they they knew this. It was fine with them as long as just like in that article uh where you know that I read from the Seymour Hirsch article where they said as long as they're throwing bombs at Hezbollah, that's all that matters. As long as they're throwing bombs at the right people. And that was the 
entire viewpoint during the war in Syria. As long as they're throwing bombs at, at the Syrian government, as long as they're, th you know, their their targets are Iran and Shias and not like Western capitals, it's fine. When did ISIS really become a problem? Because they were called Sunni rebels at first. Right. If you go back and look in the media coverage, yeah, it was right. Sunni rebels take over Mosul. But then they started launching, they started beheading Western journalists. Exactly. And they started launching attacks on European capitals. And that's when it became unacceptable. We had to go to war with ISIS. I mean, uh, I mean, same thing happened with bin Laden. Exactly. I mean, there is an article that is rather laudatory by Robert Fisk about <laughs> bin Laden in the independent. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that is not the only uh, mishap in the career of Robert Fisk. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a, there's a few more there's a few more topics I want to ask you about here before we wrap up. And one is, you know, you've mentioned the you know we've talked a lot about the Saudis. You've mentioned the Emiratis a few times. I'm curious when did the UAE start to become a player in this kind of meddling game across the region? Well, it's fair to say that UAE and Saudi Arabia have always been surreptitious players throughout the Arab world. They a lot of times they would use throw money at situations. Like for example, people don't know, every new president or leader of a poor Arab country, upon becoming a king, I mean a ruler, he receives a lump sum from the UAE and from the Saudi Arab government. I mean, uh, the decent and honest Lebanese president, Emil Lahoud, who was with the resistance, as you know, told me when he became president, the uh, this Lebanese journalist who works for the UAE, I will name him. So, I mean, why should I hide his name? His name is Bassam Freyha, and he is the owner of the Sayyad Publishing House, and he resides in the UAE. He came to Emil Lahoud and gave him a suitcase of $5 million. Wow. And when Emil Lahoud expressed surprise, he said, this is the tradition. Whenever a new president, the UAE and Saudi Arabia each gives a lump sum of $5 million. So Emil Lahoud, the honest man that he is, turned it down and he told him, thank you so much, but I don't want it. And uh, Emil Lahoud later told me that, in fact, the Lebanese journalist pocketed the five million and then the UAE found out and they were mad at him and he had to return the five million. <laughs> Saudis, on the other hand, because the prime minister is Sunni, whenever there's a new prime minister, they offer them $20 million. So they have their tentacles like that throughout the politics of the region. And also they bankroll all religious establishment to make sure that nobody is voicing any criticism of the Wahhabi doctrine of, uh, of the country. Uh, since in the new millennia, there's a different role. There's a new generation of rulers in the UAE and of uh, Saudi Arabia, very different generation. I'm not talking that the previous generation did anything for Palestine, they didn't zilch. And they were always on the side, in fact, of the enemies of Zionists, not of... Uh, on the, uh, they were on the side of the Zionists, you mean? I'm, I'm sorry, yes. They yeah. were on the side of the friends of Zionists in the Arab world, not the enemies of Zionists. Uh, I mean, but Sheikh Zayed, for example, the founder of the UAE, there's a picture of him with Leila Khalid of the PFLP. Can wow. you imagine? No. Can you imagine? Those? So the new generation, they were the ones under the guise of the United States, all established sophisticated armies and intelligence services threw so much money at them and they became ambitious to play a more assertive role. I mean, Prince Bandar, you mentioned, was national security advisor. He headed the intelligence service for a while and they wanted to become more engaged in covert and overt operation in the region. Uh, in cahoots with the United States or with Israel. Mm -hmm. UAE is more aggressive. UAE is, is trying to become a replica of Israel. In cooperation with Israel. Yeah. Israel, as you know, has been involved in every conflict in the Middle East since 1948. They were involved in the Western Sahara on the side of the Moroccan king. They were involved in uh, northern Iraq uh, throughout the years since the 1970s. They were involved in the southern Sudan conflict. They were involved in the Lebanese conflict. They were involved in the Omani conflict. They were involved in the Yemeni conflict, both of them, the 60s. And the current Yemeni conflict, always on the side, the worst side, always. And uh, the UAE has become like that. And the UAE mm -hmm. has been involved in Afghanistan. They sent a contingent to fight with the Americans. They supplied them with intelligence. They have been involved in the war in Syria. They've been involved in the war in Lebanon. Uh, and in the Palestinian scene, through Mohammed Dahlan, 
They were involved in Libya, as you know, against Turkey. They were involved in the coup that brought General Sisi to power. They are involved now in Somalia. I mean, they are now to become a regional power that right. engages in covert operation. And the Americans, because they approve of them, they don't mind them if they create militias. But if there is a group that fights Israel, suddenly you hear the Viberian dictum that there should be only monopoly of power by the state, even though the United States creates militias throughout the Middle East. Just yeah. that day I read, <coughs> people don't hear about that, there was a mutiny in Syria, in northern Syria, because the United States have its own thuggish militia called uh, Magawir Thawra, guerrillas of the revolution, American revolution, I guess. Uh, and, <laughs> The United States appointed a new uh, gangster to head the organization, and there was a mutiny in that organization. So the United States came, they used force. I don't know how many were killed or injured, and uh, they imposed their own version of the leader. Uh, so uh, the United States does not mind if militias are created as long as they are consistent with the Zionist agenda and not posing any threat to Israel. And then, of course, you know, the UAE and Saudi Arabia does this, too, but I think the UAE maybe does it more effectively, uh, but plays a mass, a, a big role in terms of media. Like There's so much soft power with media. The Gulf states basically control all the media in the Middle East at this point. Uh, they also control all of the satellite networks so that opposition media and by opposition media, I mean, like pro Hezbollah media, for example, can't get or even resistance -Israel media or even anti-Israel media. Yeah, anti-Israel media can't in Lebanon and can't get like yeah. can't get like certain satellite connections. So you don't right. see El Mayadeen everywhere like you do all of these Gulf state medias. They also uh, give a huge amount of money to think tanks. That includes the Qataris as well. Give Correct. a massive amount of money to think tanks, like millions of dollars a year to the Brookings Institute, to the Center for American Progress, all of Middle these. East, Middle East Institute. Middle East Institute. Is now basically a branch, a satellite branch of the UAE and the Saudi Embassy. I mean, that's yeah. all it is. I and mean, there's certain people, headquarters now. And there's yeah. a lot of like, they also fund like, uh, on top of having these gro like pro golf like lobbies as well. Uh, that actually have a lot of former U.S. officials in them. A lot of former U.S. officials go on after their career in government to make a lot of money of at these pro-golf think tanks, which of is why course. you don't hear them criticizing these places. And then you have people like Michael Knight of the of WinEP, uh, Washington Institute for Near East Policy, which is just like a branch of APAC, who's like famously supported by the Emiratis. I mean, and on and on and on. Could do a whole episode on just that. But this has also played a huge role in the effort to towards normalization, because like at the same time as all of this is pro imperialist and being imperialist stooges, it's also a massive money making scheme. And I actually saw you tweet this out in terms of the issue of normalization with Israel in these in these various countries. Um, there was this recent uh, New York, I believe it was a New York Times article, if I'm not mistaken. And it was noting that Trump accepted a twenty million dollar super no, PAC contrib yes. contribution from billionaire Sheldon Adelson to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So go ahead. <laughs> yes, it's a new book by the New York Times correspondent uh, called Confidence Man. It's a biography of Donald Trump, uh, which revealed that. You're absolutely right, uh, the role of the money. And uh, yeah, the entire Arab media and culture scene is totally dominated by Saudi Arabia and the UAE. The funny thing is I follow this annually, every year, every year in the UAE, in Dubai, they have prizes of Arab journalism uh, and they give them out. And every year the winners are Saudi <laughs> people, and many of them Lebanese, of course, people who write in the Saudi or UAE press, people who carry the agenda of these two governments. And it's just funny to me that the journalism prize of the Arab world are, are awarded <laughs> by the two totalitarian regimes of the region where you can serve 15 years in jail if your tweet deviates from the policies of the government. It's so amazing. And then you have like all of these, you, I remember back when um, I think it was like the Lebanese, we talked about this on the last time I had you on, it was the Lebanese information minister, maybe. I can't remember exactly which yes. minister. Information, yes. Yeah, who was like, the it's Saudis hard. got so upset. Yeah, they ha he ended up having to resign. The Saudis right. got so upset. They like blockaded Lebanon. Only because, because he said, the war in Yemen is pointless. He didn't even say anything with the Saudis. He just said the war in Yemen is pointless. Exactly. And that was too much for them. And then, the, and then what the Saudis and the UAE often do when they do this to countries like Lebanon or any other country, because there's such like a 
culture of not culture. There's an economic situation where a lot of these countries, people will go work in the Gulf states because they can make more money there because our economies in places like Lebanon are ruined. And as a result, you have all of these Lebanese workers who they'll then threaten to deport. Um, so then like basically all Arab who work in the Gulf are hostages. Exactly. They are held so, by their governments. And, so it's not surprising. I mean, like in 1990, when Yemen stood against the American war in Iraq in the United Nations Security Council, uh, the Saudi government started expelling Yemenis. Yeah. And at the time of turmoil with Egypt, they also threatened to kick Egyptians. Every time there's a crisis in Lebanon, since the 1960s, Saudi Arabia uh, you know, uh, threatens to expel these hostages out of the country. And the worst thing is you have despicable brand of Lebanese artists, journalists, and politicians. Some of them reside in UAE, some of them reside in Lebanon, who actually say we should not offend them because they make us out. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine the slave mentality of people like that? But and the same people will say, oh, why can't Lebanon be like the UAE? Or exactly. why can't Lebanon be like Saudi Arabia? So you want Lebanon to be a place where you, you love, like, I don't understand. You say you hate Hezbollah, it's anti democratic. That's what they'll say. Right. But you want Lebanon to be like these actual hereditary dictatorships? Exactly. Like, it makes no sense. Exactly. It makes absolutely zero sense. But, but those are the revolutionaries of Lebanon. Those right? are the revolutionaries. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And the, the point I want to end on here, though, which I think is kind of fascinating to watch this happen, is we are entering this era of, you know, we are in it already. It's not entering. We're in a new Cold War, right? The US wants to take on Russia and China. Many of people in the US officials want to take them on at the same time, which is just completely insane to me. So you want this on you want this cold war between the US and these other nuclear armed powers. And in this cold war, because this cold war is not ideological. It's not a war of ideology because it's not like capitalism versus communism. You think the, you think the previous one was ideological? Well it was it was and I mean the Cold War initially was a war against it was capitalism versus communism to some degree or socialism, whatever. I mean, I mean, in name, because like the United States did not mind collaborating and cooperating. That's with true. Regimes. That is true. They against the USSR. Like, that is true. Me. That is true. But there was an ideological, there, there was still an ideological battle taking place. There was a fear. I mean, in name, because like Romania was one of the most despotic of all communist regimes. It was the closest to the West only because. It was decent on Israel, and it wasn't willing. Well, there, to... there, there are exceptions. There are exceptions, yeah. but there was some level of like ideological consistency to some degree. There was two different blocks of two different ways of economic planning. Right, one was very capitalistic, corporate. The other one is some measure of state planning. I mean, the U.S. went to great lengths to make sure this didn't spread to Europe because they needed Europe to main to, to stay capitalist. So there was an element of ideology. No, but but the United States never minds leftists if they are imperialist and Zionist. It's rare, but there are exceptions. It's rare, but there are exceptions yeah. for the most part. And I think that that probably has to do with the fact that any leftist government formation is going to tend to be a proponent of of having a path independent of U.S. interests. And that's what's really unacceptable at the end of the day, is having a path independent of U.S. interests. But the point is, is now this new Cold War isn't, it's not like there's a block of countries that call themselves socialist. There's a growing block of countries that are adversaries of the U.S. because they refuse to do exactly what the U.S. wants. And Russia and China are a part of that. And the reason I raise that is to say that all of this investment in the Gulf states, despite all of this investment in the Gulf states, it's not actually paying off in this Cold War with Russia and China. That's where I'm taking this to. And it's kind of well, I am hilarious. By that too. No, that's really <laughs> amusing to watch. So this is what I wanted to show. I wanted to show this tweet. I think it's so emblematic of what I'm talking about. So I'll read it. This is Representative uh, Ro Khanna, right, member of, of Congress. He right. says, the president of the United States should make it clear that we will stop supplying the Saudis with weapons and air parts if they fleece the American people and strengthen Putin with drastic production cuts. And here he's referring to Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia, which are a part of OPEC, um, basically refusing to uh, raise the amount of oil they're producing um, because that is that's a, their way of controlling gas prices because they want gas prices to stay high because that's how they make money. I mean, at the end of the day, it's in Saudi Arabia's interest for oil prices to be slightly higher or else they'll be operating at a loss. But I just find this so funny 
that despite all of this investment, despite the Saudis and the UAE and the Qataris and all these countries being like appendages of the Americans in so many ways, in this new Cold War era, they still refuse to get on board with this war against Russia. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious what your thoughts on that are. One of the things that eventually it's going to be good for us to watch the harm that enemies like Israel, Saudi Arabia, and UAE will suffer here in the United States. They have thrown their lot so much, Netanyahu, UAE. You see, uh, UAE and, uh, and Saudi Arabia really love Netanyahu in Israel. And they really love somebody like Trump in the United States. And they are throwing their lot with that. So both Israel and UAE and Saudi Arabia have become less bipartisan than they used to, mm. which is something that's going to hurt them in the future. And for that reason, they are deliberately hurting Biden mm. in this upcoming election because they are hoping for a return of the Republicans. Uh, not that this Biden administration has not indulged these despots in the Gulf. Yes. Uh, the Israelis, I mean, under Netanyahu, done something similar. They lobbied against Obama. They made clear their Republican preference and so on. So this is the gamble that they are doing. But I think the United States is facing a problem worldwide, which is realizing that when they speak about the world, uh, they mean basically the West. Uh, because even on their policies on Ukraine, the rest of the world is not on the same side with NATO, whether you like it or not. They are not. Latin yeah. America, Asia, India even, uh, China, South Africa, they have not been with NATO. And in fact, the foreign minister of uh, Ukraine has been on a tour of Africa uh, to try to lobby support for his cause. And he's and, not getting it. And the New York Times mentioned in passing, I love that, uh, these qualifying sentences with the New York Times article. They said, it just so happens that people in Africa have a positive, favorable attitude to the to Russia because the Soviet Union supported liberation movement in the country, and they named like four countries only. And I, <laughs> no, the Soviet Union supported liberation movement in every country in Africa right. when the West was supporting the most reactionary forces and colonial powers and apartheid South Africa, of course. No, it's absolutely true. And of course, like to bring it back full circle, the Gulf states played a very crucial role in what you just mentioned, which is supporting all of those reactionary movements. On that note, I mean, I guess the last thing I would want to ask you is in terms of the Middle East, like as a region, it does seem like as the U.S. gets more um, fixated on Russia and China, there is less. Obviously, the U.S. is still very much present in the Middle East. Exactly. Very I'm much present. I'm so glad you said that. Very much present. But yeah. at the same time, it does seem like this growing multipolar world, not that it's by its own nature better. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a better world. It has given some space for the region to deal with itself, like for players to deal with each other. And as a result, you do see some countries having back channels that they didn't have a few years ago. Um, for example, the Iranians and the Saudis when it comes to Yemen um, and these sorts of things. And I'm just curious if you see that as a positive development and if you, I mean, have any optimism. That's a hard word to use. I'm not very optimistic. But if you have any optimism about the future of the region in terms of its ability to just like deal with things without the U.S. being present and interfering in every little thing that's taking place. I am very optimistic that the enemies of the Arab people are going to screw up are going to screw up big. I am very optimistic that Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, this triangle is going to really make a lot of blunders for years to come. Because now, the United States, as you said, focusing on Ukraine and Taiwan, I mean, the amount of money that has been allocated, the United States has allocated billions of dollars equal to the military budget of Russia to Ukraine. Imagine. Uh, and I mean, if I am Israel, I would look at that and be so terrified. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of money that the U.S. extends to Israel now seems so minuscule. It's compared, every few weeks, there is a new billion, 12 billion, 15 billion. And so that is going to have repercussion for the future, especially given the image of Israel is not what it used to be in the past. And if now the Saudis and the UAE and Israel 
with a propensity for adventurism uh, and less experience than the United States in imperial troublemaking, uh, I can see them messing things up. I mean, they have done that already. I mean, UAE calculation in Libya did not work. Their calculation in Syria did not work. Every time in Lebanon, they throw their lot, hoping to undermine Hezbollah from any parliamentary support. And here Hezbollah receives 100% of all Shiite seats goes to them and to their ally. So uh, things are not going their way. And I cannot see the Palestinian people agreeing to the man, to the thug that the UAE want to impose as leader of the Palestinian people. Um, but, but what troubles me really is that the media is suffocatingly one-sided, mm -hmm. controlled by Gulf uh, government, Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. And of course, the West is now creating all sorts of media throughout the region, and they call it independent media. Uh, so basically, if you want to descend to rebel, there is no out, 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 uh, outlet there. And for that reason, it's incumbent on us to support media like yours, a new radical independent media that yeah. is uh, that is rare. But really, that's where the truth lies nowadays. Mm -hmm. it doesn't, I mean, I remember in uh, after September 11, I would give lectures on university campuses before before I was deplatformed after the Syrian war, and uh, students would ask me like, uh, "Where do you recommend we go for news in the world?" And I used to recommend The Guardian. I mean, yeah. <laughs> wow, it's, what a world. It's put a gun to my head now. Now I really believe that The Guardian and The Independent are worse than The New York Times and The Washington Post. As horrible. That may be true. That and may be true with The Guardian, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're terrible, terrible media. I cannot recommend any media anywhere except the one on the very fringes uh, of, of, of even progressive media. Uh, I mean, look at The Nation magazine. Places like that. Does that anybody has anybody looked at? Okay, I shouldn't say that. That's <laughs> now I'm just being mean. But no, you're absolutely right. There is, it's a very uh, sad media environment at the moment. And you know what else it is too? It's that uh, there's not. It's it's hard to find a sustainable way to make money in media that it ends up becoming a game of then pleasing your audience. Like once you grow an audience, I mean, for a lot of people, it ends up becoming a game of of telling your audience what they want to hear and of also. And of also being frightened of being um, taken off, right? So of these point. like, of Very these like, point. yeah, social media platforms that are controlled by like Silicon Valley, and in some cases, the Saudis and other Gulf states are actually quite invested in like Twitter, for example. Right, and it's also incumbent on people like us, Rania, to sometimes, I mean, whoever our audience are, that we not be reluctant to challenge, of course, some of, them of their views, uh, whether on uh, Hezbollah, whether on Syria, whether. Or, or no, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from public experience. No, no, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but no, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, it, it's not an easy thing. Uh, anyway. Yeah, well, on that note, I really want to thank you for spending over an hour with me talking about this stuff. I think this was a oh, really, really course. amazing conversation. Anytime, anytime. All right, well, thank you so much for coming on the show and hopefully we can have you back on soon. I hope so. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.